Welcome back. In our last two lectures, we examined some of the key elements of successful autobiography, and we studied strategies and tools you can use to make your own writing more effective on those occasions when you're called upon to provide a personal narrative, to offer some written account of who you are in order to prove to or convince someone that you are worth noticing. And this can be whether you're trying to wow a college admissions officer, impress a potential new boss, or establish valuable contacts through a professional or social networking site. We saw how autobiographers such as Benjamin Franklin and Frederick Douglass crafted progressive unified accounts of their lives, how they described their interests in relation to a set of skills and talents, and how they then parlayed those skills and talents into successful careers. Franklin and Douglas also provided us with important insights into the fundamental and crucial link between autobiography and leadership. How framing your individual accomplishments within the efforts of a larger group can actually enhance your status as a potential leader, as somebody with the ability to initiate and maintain productive, reciprocal relationships with those around you. In particular, we talked about how Franklin and Douglas rely on careful and understated use of emotionally charged moments, personal experiences, in order to establish a sympathetic connection with their audiences. And we discussed how you can develop and employ this kind of connection in your own autobiographical writing, whatever your goal or your purpose might be. And this can help you persuade readers to take a favorable view of your interests, your skills, and your record of achievements. In other words, you can use this to make them like you. In this lecture, we're going to build on our study of the key elements of autobiographical writing, and we're also going to further develop the key points we covered in that four-part examination of arguments in lectures six through nine. And to do this, we're going to take a broader look at some of the concepts and ideas that serve as the foundation for successful arguments and autobiography. And these concepts really serve as the foundation, I would say, for almost all forms of effective writing. These concepts and ideas that I want to talk about starting today fall under the broad categorization or umbrella of what scholars call classical or ancient rhetoric. And they're inspired by the writings of famous figures like Plato, Aristotle, Cicero, and Longinus. These are thinkers whose work was first formulated and articulated during what we call the classical and Hellenistic Greek eras and the Roman period. And that's about roughly 500 BC through about the first century AD. Such rhetoric focuses on situations and circumstances rather than conventions or rules. And it's the situational focus that's really valuable for us as writers because it helps us to not be overly bound by certain conventions and formulas for our work. If we use rhetorical concepts as a guide, you can remain aware of certain expectations and rules, but you're aware also of possibilities and opportunities that can open up when you break those rules or ignore those conventions. So in other words, this approach can help you adapt your writing to a variety of different situations and make the most of them. This kind of rhetoric also focuses on ethics, meaning it acknowledges that while we don't have to be bound by convention, we nevertheless have certain obligations to different communities within which our writing circulates. It's not just a free-for-all. Rhetoric reminds us that we can shape our writing to take advantage of shifting situations, but at the same time we can't ignore connections to and dependence on ideas and beliefs that our communities hold dear. Still, at this moment, you might find yourself asking, why on earth should we concern ourselves with classical rhetoric? Right? It's something that people who died a long time ago were really interested in, not us. What kind of practical use could these ideas have in today's world? And it's a fair question. And I'd like to point out, it's also a rhetorical question. 
And if you were asking it, you'll realize that in the very act of doing so, you're already providing an answer for yourself. After all, the art and practice of posing rhetorical questions in order to communicate more effectively was one of the concepts that ancient and classical thinkers like Quintilian, Aristotle, and Cicero first studied and articulated. In other words, it's not as if classical rhetoric somehow evaporated or disappeared once we moved into the modern period, although a lot of people actually seem to think that this is the case. In fact, what happened was that these notions and ideas that came from classical rhetoric became so tightly woven into the fabric of Western culture's various forms of expression that we can't even see them anymore. Put another way, classical rhetoric has always been with us. It's just that it's hiding in plain sight. It's everywhere. So because of that, it actually seems like it's nowhere. And by the way, the phrase hiding in plain sight is also something that has its roots in the work of ancient and classical rhetoric. It's a variation of what Aristotle would have called a commonplace. And this is one of our key terms for today, a commonplace. A commonplace is a theme or topic that can be easily communicated to an audience using a well-known word or phrase. And the phrase itself can be brief, and the idea or topic associated with it is usually something that's a little more complicated and abstract. In this case, hiding in plain sight refers to the tendency of human beings to overlook or miss things that would otherwise be obvious to us. It's also a way of suggesting that things which seem deeply mysterious or inaccessible are often actually more familiar or more understandable than we might think at first. Most important, it's a reminder that the things in our world that can be most beneficial or most dangerous are generally found in close proximity to us and not somewhere on the distant horizon. If we can put this another way, whatever the problem, issue, or question may be, the answer, the solution, is probably a whole lot closer to home and a lot easier to spot than you might think. I want to be clear here. You don't need to know where the term commonplace comes from or actually where any of the rhetorical terms in this lecture or the next two come from. It's not my goal today to have you learn these terms and memorize them. My goal is to help you become more familiar with the ideas behind the terms. Or perhaps, really it would be more accurate to say that what I want to happen today is for you to re-familiarize yourself with these ideas so that you can apply them to your own writing in ways that are deliberate and effective. After all, if you think about it, most of us already make use of things like rhetorical questions and commonplaces when we write. As I said, it's actually difficult not to use them since they're so deeply woven into the fabric of Western culture. But most people miss out on opportunities to maximize the benefits of these ideas because they're not always mindful or aware of them and they don't tend to use them regularly or systematically to make their writing more powerful. So our aim then is to identify, to define, and then provide some examples of rhetorical concepts that you probably already have some familiar, familiarity with, but which you probably aren't using deliberately or systematically in your own writing. That's our goal for today. Some people have a real gift for this sort of thing. Consciously or unconsciously, they manage to incorporate the most fundamentally powerful elements of rhetoric into whatever it is they're writing. But for most of us, the process of effectively applying these ideas requires a whole lot more deliberate effort and a really heightened awareness of what rhetorical elements are going to help us most in a given writing situation. So in today's lecture, we're going to look at what I think are four of the most readily and widely applicable rhetorical concepts that you can use to strengthen your writing. And these are commonplaces, which we've already touched on, something called stasis, deductive reasoning, and inductive reasoning. Again, commonplaces, stasis, deductive reasoning, and inductive reasoning. 
Now, these words and phrases might seem a little odd or awkward, and I'm not expecting you to finish this lecture and go around using these terms on a daily basis. But you might keep a small piece of paper next to your computer or on your writing desk with these terms and the ones we're going to discuss in our next two lectures written down on it. The idea here would be that this is a little cheat sheet. It could serve as a reminder to you when you're writing to consider these elements. Doing this will probably make whatever you're working on a better piece of writing. At the very least, it will cause you to focus your attention more intently on a particular moment or aspect of your writing, and thus, it will make it better. Now, what we're going to cover today is by no means an exhaustive survey of the four ideas of commonplace stasis, stasis inductive reasoning, and deductive reasoning. If you want to grasp the full extent of what ancient and classical rhetoric can offer us on these topics, that would take years of study, and I don't think we have time for that. What I'm providing for you here are basic versions of what scholars of rhetoric would speak of in much greater depth and probably in a much more nuanced, sophisticated way than what I'm going to do here today. But we can cover enough in one lecture to make these terms useful and helpful to you in your own work. So we've already touched on one important and easy to use rhetorical notion, the commonplace. Let's explore this a bit more before we move on to the other tools that I think you're going to find useful when you're writing, no matter what the specific situation is. For our purposes today, I think the best way to define a commonplace is to call it a piece of truth, which is wrapped up in easily recognizable language. And the notion of truth I'm getting at here is not some empirical fact or piece of data. Rather, it's some kind of thought or behavior that's familiar and recognizable enough to a certain group of people that they're going to respond positively to it, even if they can't always precisely identify what it is that they find familiar or correct about that commonplace. An example of a commonplace for most Americans is the notion that we have a right to the pursuit of happiness. It's one of the most widely recognized and accepted ideas from the Declaration of Independence. And I think it's a safe bet to make that the majority of U.S. citizens, no matter what their politics, would respond positively if a writer were to invoke this idea. And those same citizens would, and do, of course, have widely differing opinions about what happiness is and how one might go about pursuing it. And those differing opinions would, of course, require their own commonplaces if a writer wants to go on and forge a connection with the various members of these various audiences. But the point here is that effective writers must identify an idea, a belief, or an action that the majority of their readers will find both recognizable and acceptable. And what this does is creates a sense of solidarity and good feeling. And once you've done this, the writer can then move on to address other points that might generate disagreement. In other words, it's a way of getting everyone into a similar, comfortable intellectual space before you start to present a case or idea that may not be so familiar or comfortable to them. Let's take another example. And this one is a little more specific to my own position. As a university professor, I respond positively to the idea of tenure. And for those of you unfamiliar with the workings of academia, tenure means essentially that after a probationary period, and this is usually around six years, in which I have the chance to prove that I'm doing my job well, and this means I'm teaching my classes, I've published research in my field, and I've done my fair share of service to my department, to my university, and to the larger profession. Well, after that probationary period, then I'll be granted tenure, which means job security. Now, people can and have lost their tenure. It does happen, but it's unusual. And in order for this to happen, you would have to essentially check out of doing your job. But to me, Tenure is a commonplace that signifies the freedom to pursue research without fear of censure. If I happen to be a medieval literature scholar, which I am, by the way, 
and the president of my university happens to hate Chaucer and all other medieval writers, which, by the way, is not at all true, but let's roll with it for the sake of this example. If I have tenure, my president can't fire me or try to redirect my scholarship. He or she can't say, work on something more relevant to today's world than Chaucer, or you're going to lose your job. Tenure protects me from that threat. And again, let me be clear that this is a hypothetical example. My own university president has been very supportive of the liberal arts in general and the English department in particular. And also, I would say, I can list any number of reasons why it's incredibly important and relevant to today's world to study Chaucer, but we're not going to go into that here. There are a number of different issues and arguments associated with tenure, but in a general sense, most university professors would recognize what it means and most would see it in a positive light. Any writer who wanted to address an audience of university professors could use the commonplace of tenure as a way of generating a sense of solidarity. We would all recognize its meaning and agree, more or less, that it's a good thing. Now, that same writer could then go on to discuss some of those other issues and arguments associated with tenure, several of which might identify its downsides and its drawbacks. But that writer would already have given herself or himself a better chance of keeping and holding the audience's attention by invoking the commonplace as a source of general agreement and good feeling. My takeaway point here is that good writers make an effort to identify and regularly employ commonplaces that are relevant to their readers, whether that's a group of business people working in a particular field or members of a certain profession like law or medicine, or even an individual age group or particular demographic. It's not simply a matter of knowing your audience, although obviously figuring that out is usually a pretty good first step. Rather, what it's about is identifying what ideas or beliefs are so powerful and so widespread among members of that audience that you can be sure they'll take your writing seriously, even if, at the end of the day, they might end up disagreeing with your ultimate conclusions. The next concept I want us to look at is called stasis. In classical rhetoric, Stasis refers to the general agreement between opposing parties about what the terms of the argument are. In other words, a commonly held definition or understanding of the issue in dispute. The problem, as you might guess, is that very often the parties that are, that are in conflict with one another or won't agree on a common definition or understanding of the argument's terms can't move beyond that initial disagreement. If I refer to the issue as one thing, but you see it as something else, we're not likely to be able to stage a productive argument about it. We'll certainly disagree with each other, maybe passionately so, but our argument's not going to go anywhere because we'll spend all our time fighting over the terms and the labels we want to use. You can probably see already how the concept of stasis is related to the notion of the commonplace. Both hinge on the need for agreement. Let's go back to my example of the commonplace for most Americans of the right to the pursuit of happiness. I mentioned earlier that while most U.S. citizens would agree that this right is a good thing, they may have very different views on what constitutes happiness and how one should pursue it. And here's where the idea of stasis comes into play. Imagine you are someone who loves playing the poker game Texas Hold'em, and you especially love playing for money, and you happen to live in Las Vegas where such gambling perfectly legal. For you, playing Texas Hold'em for money is the epitome of the pursuit of happiness. Okay, now imagine that you have a spouse and that your spouse was raised to view card playing as a sin and to view sin as especially egregious if there's money at stake. For your spouse, gambling is the devil's work. As long as the two of you can't agree on what the terms of the argument are, is card playing for money a source of happiness or is it a sign of moral turpitude, then we can say that stasis has not been achieved. Even if you both accept the commonplace that Americans have the right to the pursuit of happiness and that, since we're in Las Vegas, gambling isn't 
a legal transgression, you still haven't achieved stasis since you can't agree on whether Texas Hold'em is innocent entertainment or a state of perdition. Okay, so why should stasis matter when it comes to writing? Just as effective writers must make an effort to identify common places that are relevant to their readers, they also have to make an effort to identify the terms of an argument and recognize when those terms have been agreed upon and when they have not. I'm not suggesting that writers must always strive for stasis or that they must change their terms or viewpoints in order to do this. That is not my point. But it's possible to craft a powerful piece of writing simply by showing readers how and why stasis has not been achieved with regard to a particular issue, to identify the terms that are problematic, and to clarify the overall scope and the content of the debate, even if it seems that the debate itself can't be resolved. Because certainly, we all recognize that some debates can't be brought to a close, and we can all benefit from having a better sense of why the parties involved continue to remain in dispute with each other. In addition to a lack of stasis, one of the reasons that certain debates are not easily resolved, or ever resolved, is because the writers who address the issue don't make effective use of different forms of reasoning to appeal to their audience. In this final section of the lecture, we're going to cover two types of reasoning, deductive and inductive. And classical rhetoricians, like Aristotle, viewed the methods by which we move from the knowledge we already have to the knowledge that is yet to be discovered and articulated as being achieved by deductive and inductive reasoning. Okay, so let's start with deductive reasoning, the kind that many people are familiar with from detective stories and murder, history, murder mysteries. I mean, the entire Law & Order television franchise depends on writers who understand how to use deductive reasoning, although for entertainment purposes rather than, say, generating knowledge. Deductive reasoning begins with a generally accepted declaration or premise, something that most people take to be true most of the time. The writer then uses that premise to make sense of a specific event, a specific occurrence, or a specific phenomenon. In most Sherlock Holmes stories, for example, the detective relies on what he knows to be generally true. And these would be things like, a certain type of mud can only be found in a certain region of England. And then he uses this knowledge to make sense of individual clues. Well then, if that type of mud appears on a man's shoes, we can reasonably deduce that the man, or at least his shoes, were recently in that part of England. To put all this another way, when we reason deductively, we reason from the general in order to make sense of the particular or the specific. The opening lines of Jane Austen's famous novel, Pride and Prejudice, set up just such an occasion for deductive reasoning by establishing a general premise about the circumstances of wealthy, unmarried men. And as you may recall, that opening line is, it is a truth universally acknowledged that a single man in possession of a good fortune must be in want of a wife. Okay, indeed, most of the rest of the novel could be read as an attempt to make sense of the actions and the words of particular characters. And a lot of these characters, if you've read the book, you know they're lots of young men with fortunes and several characters who are young women with the potential to be wives. And so we might then read the whole rest of the book in light of that opening claim. And so long as the characters act or speak, in ways that seem to affirm Austen's foundational premise, everything that happens within the fictional world of the novel makes sense. Now, if you're thinking to yourself, as you very well might be right now, that Austen's opening premise sounds a lot like the concept of the commonplace, which we discussed earlier, I would say that you are thinking absolutely correctly. And you don't have to be a novelist to use this connection to your advantage. Once you've identified your commonplace and you framed it as a premise, or if we want to go back and use Austin's words, framed it as a truth universally acknowledged, 
you've given your readers just what they expect and just what they need to then interpret any of the descriptions, the claims, or the information you might offer them in the pages to follow. Even if the material you include doesn't always seem to affirm this opening premise, just like the actions in the words of some of Austen's characters don't always seem to support her claim that all single men with money are all looking for wives, it remains likely that your readers will stick with you, and they may even overlook some inconsistencies or discrepancies because they have been primed to accept the deductive process as a useful source of knowledge, and generally speaking, as a reliable way of trying to make sense of the world, or at the very least, make sense of the world of the book. As you might guess, not all instances of reasoning follow the deductive pattern. Sometimes a process is inductive, meaning a writer will examine particular events or subsets of phenomena and use them as the basis for then constructing a premise that would apply to any events or incidents that are similar to that one. So, in other words, to reason inductively is to move from particulars to generalizations. You go from specific examples to broader assertions about how something based on this evidence is true or how something works. So what you're doing here is rather than using pre-existing theories to make sense of whatever evidence or clues you have, you would use those clues and those bits of evidence to then construct your theories. So if we were to rewrite Pride and Prejudice, following an inductive pattern, we would begin not with those famous first lines, but we'd begin by describing the words and actions of each single male character, assessing any differences and oddities of behavior, weighing them against similarities, and ultimately identifying the most common traits linking them to each other. Our descriptions would probably have to then take into account how each single male interacted with female characters who could be potential wives. And we'd want to make it apparent to our readers that, in general, the men with more money seem to be operating under the assumption, which was sometimes not spoken aloud, sometimes it was openly stated, that getting yourself a spouse would be a good and a necessary thing to do. Only then, after a comprehensive descriptive survey, could we help our readers formulate the theory that single men with good fortunes must want wives. And this would be in opposition to the many other possible theories we could construct based on the evidence that we have before us. We could come up with a theory like, all single men with money tend to make poor first impressions. That's absolutely a legitimate conclusion that you could reach after reading Austen. Or we could come up with rich young men aren't very good at conveying their true feelings for young women. Or well-off single men must really like to attend formal parties and balls. If you've read Pride and Prejudice, you might see what I'm getting at. Inductive reasoning opens up lots of potential theories, but it's up to the writer to decide which ones are most important to identify for the reader. All of which, by the way, still leave us unsure about whether Mr. Darcy and Miss Elizabeth Bennet really were suited for each other after all. My takeaway points here are that inductive reasoning can be put to effective use in your writing and that you should always keep it in mind as an alternative to the deductive process, especially when you're faced with a writing task that compels you to describe a wide range of evidence and try and make sense of it for your audience. As the ancient and classical rhetorical scholars would remind you, as the writer, you are in charge of determining what commonalities or links in your evidence are most important and most worthy of being presented as truths that should be universally acknowledged. In our next two lectures, we'll build on our discussion of the four rhetorical concepts we've covered here, commonplaces, stasis, deductive and inductive reasoning, and we're going to examine another four terms and ideas that can, you can incorporate into your own writing to make it more persuasive and compelling. These four terms are invention, arrangement, 
ethos, and pathos. In our next lecture, we're going to focus on invention and arrangement.